first B-58 Hustler bomber took the skies the 11th of November 1956, it was incredible. Never before such a concentration of revolutionary technology was ever included in an aircraft. In this video, the second of the series, we are going to examine some of them. As usual, stay till the end because what we're going to discuss here is not easy to find in any other video. One of the first revolutionary features of the B-58 Hustler was the use of new structural designs and materials in constructing the aircraft. The aircraft structure was heavily stressed, not only in terms of aerodynamic loads, but also because of its high speed. Through skin friction at Mach 2, the exterior surfaces could reach temperatures above 250 degrees Fahrenheit. With the inboard jet engines venting their exhaust beneath the wing, there was also a concern over sonic vibration fatigue at high sound level affecting the wing structure. Sound may not seem a source of stress, but it is. It is vibrations at the end. So, in an extreme test, Convair actually ran the inboard engines of a B-58 for 10 hours with afterburners, causing sound levels up to 171 decibels to test the wing structure for sonic fatigue. And yes, it was on the ground, obviously. Some say that internally the B-58 was built like a ship. Surely it was a departure from classic airframe structures. It actually featured transverse duralluminium spars corrugated for strength, spaced only 11 to 15 inches apart, running from one wing margin through the fuselage to the extremity of the opposite wing. There were no cordwise ribs, only short cordwise or oblique structural elements to serve as attachments for elevons, engine nacelles and landing gear. For covering the wing, Convair created a new material, a new type of composite. Stiff, strong, light, relatively easy to replace and with good thermal insulating qualities. It was named the bonded sandwich panel. The top and bottom of the sandwich was covered with panels of duraluminium alloy about one millimeter thick. The filling, about half inch thick, was made of tiny honeycombs of phenolic resin impregnated fiberglass cloth. The core was bonded to the outer layers with phenolic adhesives and then heated at a pressure of 175 psi at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours. Absolute cleanliness was essential for solid bonding and the department of the conveyor plant where this was done was known as the hospital. Finally, the panel was attached to the wing structure with titanium screws to allow for an easier and stress-free replacement. In areas exposed to high temperatures, such as the aft section of the engine nacelles and the elegons, uh, which dip into the blast of the jet, panels of stainless steel sandwich replace the fiberglass ones. The concept that led to this revolutionary design was called high density by Convair. In practice, they tried using all the available internal volume for something. This led to a design where the whole interior of the wing and most of the interior of the fuselage were filled with fuel. The space enclosed by the wing and the fuselage aft of the crew compartment was divided by bulkheads into four tanks. The largest was the aft tank in the aft portion of the wing and it contained a maximum of 39,800 pounds of JP4 fuel. The forward tank in the forward part of the wing contained a maximum of 20,600 pounds of fuel and there was also a reservoir tank above the wing with 4,200 pounds. In the tail of the aircraft at the level of the elevons was located a balanced tank containing a maximum of 8,200 pounds of fuel. The pods carried beneath the aircraft were also largely filled with fuel. The MB pod was 57 foot long and contained mostly fuel other than the nuclear warhead. The TC pod was in two parts. 
a 54 foot long lower element that was designed to be dropped before the high speed penetration leg and it was filled entirely with fuel. A 35 foot long upper pod contained 2,500 pounds of fuel and a warhead. When filled to the brim, the Hustler could carry in its internal and pod tanks a maximum of 101,600 pounds of JP4, about 57% of the gross weight of the plane. The fact that the fuel was a high fraction of the total weight was a source of problems. At supersonic speeds, the center of pressure moves well aft of its subsonic location, and ideally the pilot would move the center of gravity backwards as well to maintain the appropriate stability and to reduce the trim drag for the most economical cruise. Trim drag was a serious problem on the B-58, like all the early deltas. The B-58 flight manual was full of tables stating the best position for the center of gravity depending on the weight, the speed and the height. An automatic computer control programmer pumped the fuel aft from the forward tank to the balance tank or forward into the forward tank as necessary to bring the center of gravity within the required limits. This feature was absolutely critical because in case of malfunction, the center of gravity shifts could be lethal for the aircraft. Complete loss of control. The center of gravity position was constantly checked by one of the crew members to be ready to fix malfunctions and the pilot was constantly informed. The four engines of the B-58 Hustler were General Electric J795As or 5Bs. They were rated at 10,000 pounds with maximum afterburner. The engines were remarkable for the time because they had variable position inlet guide vanes and variable position stator vanes in the first six stages of the compressor. These were automatically set in relation to engine speed and compressor inlet temperature to admit the correct amount of air to the compressor and to direct it against the rotating compressor vanes at the proper angle of attack thereby minimizing the possibility of compressor stall. Nozzle flap in the engine outlet area provided for optimum thrust and specific fuel consumption under different engine operating conditions, and they were opened and closed by the throttles. The throttles had six settings. Three were the classic off, idle and military. To achieve the design speed, the Hustler had to be driven by the afterburners and these increase their thrust as the throttles are advanced to min afterburner, max afterburner and OVSP, that is overspeed. In the latter setting, the engines were allowed to overspeed at 103.5% of their maximum RPM. I was actually unable to verify the point, but it seems also that there was a way of operating at 107% RPM for 5 seconds or less. But operating above 107% for any engine uh, required the engine to be returned to the factory for a full overhaul. With a takeoff gross weight of 163,000 pounds, a landing gross weight of 75,000 pounds, and a touchdown speed of 165 knots, the landing gear, the wheels, and the brakes of the B-58 took a hard punishment. The two main gears featured four non-frangible steel wheels, each bearing to 22 inches diameter tires inflated to 240 psi. An enormous amount of energy was absorbed even in a normal landing. The brakes could be hit to the point that tires or hydraulic fluid fires were expected. Firefighters had to approach the landing gear from the front or the rear due to the danger of tire explosions. There were also two separate and independent hydraulic systems, the primary and utility, each having two engine-driven pumps maintaining a pressure of 3000 psi. Both systems shared the operation of the flight controls, the elevons and the rudders. 
Should one fail, the other system could assume the full load. Should both hydraulic systems fail, the pilot had no further means of controlling the aircraft and the crew had to eject. The hydraulic system also operated the landing gear, nose wheel steering, wheel brakes, tail turret, aileron, elevator and the rudder damper servos. A pneumatic system was available for emergency extension of the landing gear and for emergency braking. Electric generators driven by engines number 1, 2 and 3 provided 115 or 200 volt alternating current which powered part of the avionics and the fuel pumps. Some of the alternating current was rectified to provide multiple direct current between 28 and 250 volts to caution and warning lamps and other avionics working in DC. The defense system's operator's cockpit was practically lined with panels of individual fuses which were uh, to be checked by running the hand over them a small pin protruding from the cap marked a blown fuse. Other fuse panels were in the navigator's cockpit. Obviously, even the cockpit itself in such a plane was very particular, but this will be the subject of the next episode. And stay tuned, because we are nowhere near the end. I had to break this story in various episodes because it, there is an enormous amount of information. However, if you like this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me in the meanwhile. Please like, dislike and subscribe or hit the bell so you won't miss anything. If you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, that would be amazing and you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very, very much for watching and see you the next time.